Yeah, so the next person we are going to be calling off is the founder and CEO of Moby Health International. Moby Health International, and she's going to be talking about innovating in healthcare and, Moby, and the Moby Health story. Innovating in healthcare, the Moby Health story. So we, let's jam our hands together as we welcome Dr. Fumi Adewara. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to be here. What an honor to be in this auspicious atmosphere. I want to thank Tony and the organizers for inviting me. I think we all agree that there's no true economic prosperity without healthcare. So healthcare is sector agnostic, and that's why I'm asked to speak about health. Uh, because air pollution contributes a lot to um, health to diseases, whether it's respiratory, cardiovascular, affects our children, unborn children. So it's, it's good to talk about health, even though we're all talking about clean energy. <laughs> I grew up in northern Nigeria. I was born in Kaduna to a very resourceful family. My mom was a, a nurse and a social worker in ABU teaching hospital. So I think I got my entrepreneurial flair for my mom. I used to go with her to hospital when I was very young, and I had my book in one hand. But my mother, like many of the women these days, have had a side hustle. So she sold leather goods to her colleagues at work, and I would take them and deliver them uh, to them at the time. Uh, what can you see from this picture? I just want three people to give me what you can see from each of the pictures that kind of connects with my future about being an entrepreneur. Yes, please. What can you see from my eyes in the first picture? Anyone? Any takers? Sorry? Hello. Curiosity, thank you. And what can you see in the other picture over there? Fantastic. The one up there, can you see anything? Does it tell you anything? I was writing. No, I was holding a knife. I've always been a risk taker. Can you imagine me holding a knife on the blade? And I sustained an injury in this finger. And I'm going to tell you that story later. At the age of 10, I came back from boarding house, gravely ill. Doctors were on strike. Hospitals were shut. The closest facility to us was 10 miles away. Private hospital was expensive. My mother feared that I was going to die. She ran to, the to, the, to one of our colleagues who luckily came in to save my life. And I remember very well during the course of my admission, I would hear the wailings of mothers who lost their children to preventable illnesses, families who, loved, who lost loved ones, mostly as a result of delayed presentation high cost of treatment, lack of money, 95% of people in Nigeria do not have health insurance, exposure to counterfeit medicines, and our behavior to health shows that most people will first go and take Agbo. In fact, there's one Agbo seller on social media that has more followers than any health tech entrepreneur. I was guilty of that. So yes, at that age, I experienced the wailings of mothers families who lost their loved ones. That sealed my fate in medicine because I wanted to help more people. And after I left here, after my youth service, I went to England. I worked in the NHS for over 10 years. I also worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I decided that I needed to come back and make a difference. Why? Nigeria currently has less than 6% of the doctors that we need according to the World Health Organization. The WHO recommends that we need one doctor to 600 people. Currently, Nigeria has one to 10,000. Okay, let me make it clearer to you. Nigeria is about two thirds the size of the US. America has 1.2 million doctors. Nigeria had 72,000 doctors on the register, but right now we have less than 20,000 doctors, and they are living in droves. You've heard about how the National Assembly tried to stop people from migrating. 
that wouldn't fly. So if we have everything in place today, it would take us more than 100 years to train the workforce that we need to take care of our growing population. We rank one of the poorest in healthcare systems in the world, 157th position. Less than of primary health centers are functional. In real settings, what the norm is supposed to be, the primary health centers are supposed to take care of more than 70% of your need. So that's your first place to go. But most people defer, they default to the secondary and tertiary centers, and that puts a lot of pressure on our tertiary centers. So you can imagine the primary health centers, over 30,000 of them in Nigeria are in obsolete dilapidated states. As you're sitting here, every two minutes, a child in sub-Saharan Africa dies needlessly from complications of malaria. Yet, we are one of the fastest growing markets in mobile technology growth. We have over 180 million mobile users. And when you talk about universal health coverage, lack of funding, I always said this. You spend a lot of time on social media. You burn data. But 95% of people lack health insurance. Nigerians currently spend over $600 million every month on airtime and data. That's over $9 billion, yet we have no 95% lack health insurance. So it's about priority. The justification for digital health telemedicine is that it can help to resolve more than 60% of medical problems proven over two decades. Telemedicine simply means using modern day technology to provide clinical care from a distance. The COVID pandemic has accelerated its adoption and I'll tell you my experience as a founder when I started Mobi Health, because at the time, it wasn't common. And I remember even in the UK when I went into a room and I asked people, what is telemedicine? Less than 1% of people know what telemedicine is. Apart from being a doctor, I was curious. I didn't want to study public health for my master's. So I was looking for something that had a flair of business and healthcare. So I stumbled on that course the most versatile course I've come across. is a master's in bioscience enterprise, so I studied that in Cambridge. It has to do with bringing scientific innovations to scale in the market. So I had a very big vision. And today, I look at my humble beginning from going to public school. So I was born in Kaduna. I, went, I was the only one in my home who went to a public school. And to being shown and celebrated at Times Square in New York, has been incredible and uh, very mind-blowing. Thank you. I started Mobi Health at the most difficult period of my life, and I hope that my story inspires somebody in the audience today. I founded it in 2017, November. I was in the most difficult situation. Um, I was going through a very terrible divorce. I had two children who were five years old. They were twins. They were privately schooled. So I came from that position of being nearly homeless. I, didn't, I was confused, alone. People ask me today, how did you come from that place to here? How did you die, did you kill yourself? But I think that, um, yes, my children sustained me because when I wake up and I see them, I had every reason to, to want to leave again. But importantly, my faith. Um, I've all, my teachers call me an eternal optimist. I always see the cup as half full. So I picked myself up from nearly being homeless. I had two months of my license to practice, and that's a deal for another day. So I started off, I was working in the NHS as a locum doctor, and I used the money that I had to bootstrap the company. I was using my money to pay developers, uh, to pay uh, my team, who were scattered across four continents. So my sleep pattern was disrupted. Entrepreneurs, we are crazy, aren't we? That's what <laughs> Steve Jobs said. He said, the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are actually the people who do. I love what the first, earlier speaker said, that if your dreams, that, um, your dreams are valid, and you have to believe that they're valid, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it. So fast forward from November 2017 when we then, I was looking for a solution that would fit 
a perfect match, uh, fit for Africa. Ten minutes is not enough to do justice to my story. So please pardon me if I take extra time. But I'll be very quick. I was looking for a perfect fit, but I couldn't get. The solutions in the West, they were not made for Africa. They were cost prohibitive. They were not designed for our multiple pain points. So I had to do a lot of research, a lot of failings here and there. And this is again to inspire you. Nobody starts off anything knowing it all. Do not let perfection stand in your way of innovation. Start off. So we, we went ahead and we, did a, we finally found our own product, did beta testing and launched in January 2020, just before COVID pandemic. So we had our finger on the pulse. What am I saying? Everything may not be in order and sometimes you had an idea that is probably way ahead of its time. Um, Jack Ma said that if everything is in place, then you don't have a business, you don't have a solution. So you are always going to be likely ahead of time. So don't get discouraged because of that. We then went on, you know, healthcare, they always say it's a business that may not be product, uh, it's not profitable. People don't think that you can make profit. But well, we launched commercially in January 2020. I had raised funds from family, friends, by bootstrapping at the time. And then in 2020, our revenue was barely less than $100,000, which was remarkable for a startup. Then 2021, we grew our revenue to close to a million dollars. It was within Nigeria, 2022, we maintained the same. We pioneered telemedicine in the Nigerian Air Force and partnered with other organizations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So we are now currently in our growth phase and we're looking at global expansion, Pan-African expansion. I had a big dream from the start. If your dreams do not scare you, they're not big enough. Don't be scared to dream big. And don't say because somebody else has done it and failed or somebody you have so much respect for has done it and failed. There will be many naysayers. Don't let that stop you. Um, so telemedicine is booming. It's growing exponentially at a CAGR of 27%, estimated to reach about $600 billion by 2033. Africa and Middle East will account for over $11 billion of that market. Nigerians currently spend nearly $2 billion on medical tourism. So what is our solution? Um, yeah, so we created this solution because I recognize that, yes, we have mobile phone users and the rest, but the people who really need health care, they are in the rural hard to reach areas, 70% of the population. How do we get this across to them? So we built a hybrid model where we have a mobile application, web application, and a telehealth clinic. The telehealth clinics, they come with solar power, they are AI powered. And you know, in the early days of telemedicine, people worried about how will the doctor listen to my heart, lungs, know what is wrong with me without touching me. Technology has changed that. So you see those devices that you see up there, you have digital stethoscope, so I can listen to your heart. I may be in London, I can be in Kaduna. We have women who are in Kogi State, in Kaduna, in Kano that we are managing. They can see your heart sound, your vital signs, focus, point of care, ultrasound. I can scan a pregnant woman with a simple iPad and a probe, and it's FDA approved. We have a digital scanner for the chest, and so many others like that. So these are the innovations that we developed, and we are scaling this across the country. Just a few more slides. Our business model is very simple, it's B2B, B2C, and B2G. And I know with all these things I'm saying, you're thinking, how affordable is this technology? From as low as 5,000 Naira a year, a family can access a doctor from the comfort of their home, computers, or a walk-in clinic. How remarkable. Thank you. And that will constitute only 10% of my, of my revenue. 90% of our revenue comes from the diaspora through our premium service. Those who like to travel, those who have families back home. Nigerians in the diaspora remit over $25 billion every year back home to their families. Research shows that 10 to 20% is used for paying medical bills of their families. That's the target market. So our premium service actually accounts for 10% of our volume, but almost 70% of our revenue stream. Can you see how that is profitable? 
We partnered with organizations like the banks, Union Bank, recently with HMO, Sunu HMO, uh, the Nigerian Air Force there, the US uh, CDA. We got a million dollar grant from the US CDA last year to carry out a feasibility study. Thank you. Oh, you're here, sorry. And of course, this has earned us a lot of awards globally and for which we are very grateful. Um, there's a lot of stories to tell about um, the next phase, which includes, I mean, talking about digital health adoption in Nigeria, you have to think about multiple challenges like infrastructural deficit. If somebody does not have light and power to, to power their phones, how do they then make use of your technology? And that's why we had to build a hybrid model where the women can walk into the telehealth clinics and get the help that they need. So there's a lot of, if we want this solution to have greater impact, we need government buy-in, we need a lot of awareness to be created. Um, currently, the, the coercive digital policy is still lacking, so there needs to be a coercive digital policy. Innovation requires a perfect storm of, Nigeria requires a perfect storm of innovation, investment, and the right policies. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That was a wonderful one. Ten minutes cannot be enough for this kind of conversation. Sorry. <laughs> but it's very wonderful that they think about you, they think about me, they think about how to make it easy. Imagine 5,000 naira for a whole 